Measuring a quantum superposition is as random as flipping a coin. But how far can we take that analogy before it breaks down? We'll find out today on Kiskit in the Classroom. Welcome to Kiskit in the Classroom, a video series where we break down a fundamental concept that you might encounter in a quantum computing related course. Each video is accompanied by an interactive module linked in the description below, so be sure to check that out. Today, we're talking about one of the core principles at the heart of quantum theory, superposition. In our everyday experience, objects always have definite features. Their location, size, shape, color, everything about them is determined and certain, even if we, the observer, haven't yet measured it. In the quantum world, this isn't necessarily the case. A quantum object can be in something called a superposition of multiple classically allowed states, which, when it's measured, will randomly collapse to one of those states. Measuring a superposition state is like flipping a coin. There's no way to know ahead of time which way it'll land. This fundamental indeterminism is an uncomfortable aspect of quantum mechanics that even Einstein had trouble with. He famously said, God does not play dice about this randomness. But as we'll see, God in fact does play dice, or in our case, he flips coins. But what's more, these coins are loaded. Measuring a quantum superposition may be similar to flipping a coin in some ways, but the superposition itself is much richer and more complex than a classical probabilistic state. To see this, we're gonna think about how a classical coin works and contrast this with our quantum coin, that we'll explore using Qiskit on an IBM quantum computer. First, a classical coin. It's pretty simple. You toss the coin and it lands either heads up or heads down with 50% chance of each. Well, in principle, we could calculate which side the coin will land on if we knew the precise initial conditions of the coin and exactly how much force and torque were applied during the flip. But in practice, there's no way to know a priori which side the coin will land on. That's why we use the coin flip as a canonical example of a classical probabilistic state, where the outcome is essentially random. If I were to flip this coin a thousand times and record the number of heads up and heads down, I would get a histogram that looks something like this. So we have counts on the y-axis, and it could be either heads up or heads down. And the histogram would show that there's about 500 counts of each, up to some statistical fluctuation. We can create a similar state using a qubit on our quantum computer. Like the coin flip, a qubit can also be measured in two possible states, 0 and 1. If we apply something called a Hadamard gate to the qubit, it'll put it in an equal superposition of 0 and 1. Here's a visualization of that circuit, which we call a circuit diagram. Here, the top wire is the qubit, and the operations applied to the qubit show up as boxes on the wires. The Hadamard gate is shown with this box, labeled H, and the measurement is shown with this gray box, labeled with the little measurement symbol. It sends that measurement to a classical bit, this wire with two lines. So since the qubit is in an equal superposition of 0 and 1 when we measure it, there will be a 50% chance that we measure 0 and 50% we measure 1. We express this quantum superposition state as psi equals 1 over square root 2, 0, plus 1 over square root 2, 1, where the squares of each of these coefficients also called amplitudes, are the probabilities of measuring each state. So in effect, applying the Hadamard gate is the analog to flipping a coin. And just like we flipped the coin a thousand times to look at the statistics of the coin landing heads up or heads down, we can do something similar on Qiskit with our quantum coin. We'll use a Qiskit primitive called sampler, which will repeat the circuit several times to sample the statistics of the resulting state. With a thousand samples of the circuit above, we have something that looks basically identical to the classical coin histogram, up to some statistical fluctuation. So is that it? 
Quantum superpositions are essentially the same as a classical probabilistic state, akin to flipping a coin? Not quite. This would be a pretty short video if that were the case. To see our first key difference, I'm going to try something slightly different with my classical coin. Instead of simply letting it fall onto the table, landing either heads up or down, I'm going to toss the coin and catch it midair between my palms. Now the coin is not heads up or down, but instead it's either heads left or right. So logic tells us that this too should have a 50-50 probability of being either heads left or right. To measure heads left or right on our quantum coin, we can do what we did with the classical coin, measure along a different axis. Our standard measurements on the quantum computer are along the vertical axis, just like the usual heads up or down measurement of the classical coin. But we can also ask our quantum coin if it's heads left or right. We call these two states along the x-axis plus or minus. For this, we use the Kiskit primitive called estimator. To complicate things a bit, instead of returning a histogram like Sampler does, Estimator will instead give us the so-called expectation value of any observable of the qubit. To understand this expectation value, let's say you get a dollar every time the coin lands heads up and lose a dollar when it lands heads down. The expectation value is how much money you can expect to earn on average with each coin toss. Since you're equally likely to gain or lose a dollar, the expectation value would be zero. This same reasoning can be applied to the qubit when we find the expectation value of x. When we apply x to the plus state, we get the value plus one, and to the minus state, we get minus one. So if we had a 50-50 distribution, we would get an expectation value of zero. But we don't. We get an expectation value of plus one meaning the coin is always measured to be plus along the x-axis. That would be like flipping a coin, clap catching it, and guaranteeing that the head would always be facing to the right. This is because a superposition is not just a probability distribution. Remember how we express a quantum state. Psi is equal to C0 times the state 0 plus C1 times the state 1 where each of these coefficients are complex, meaning they have both real and imaginary parts. So they tell us about the probabilities, but they also hide another quantity called the phase. Some coefficient c can be written like this, where c equals the magnitude times this phase, where this phi is the phase. It's a bit like the phase of a wave, or the location of a wave's crests and troughs. If two waves are in phase with one another, so their crests and troughs line up, then they'll combine to form a wave twice as high. We call this constructive interference. If they're out of phase, like this, then they interfere destructively, completely canceling each other out. To see how the phase can cause interference in our quantum coin, let's try to apply the Hadamard two times instead of just once. Now classically, this wouldn't make any sense. If applying the Hadamard is equivalent to flipping a coin, then you can't flip a coin that's already flipping. But let's see what happens quantum mechanically. So we apply the Hadamard twice, and we sample the resulting state. Amazingly, we no longer have a 50-50 probability. The resulting histogram shows that for every case, we measure the qubit to be in the zero state. So the second Hadamard has returned the qubit to the zero state where we started. It's a bit tricky to see at first, but this is thanks to the interference of the quantum state. But rather than interfering in real space, like an actual wave, the interference is happening in abstract information space of the qubit. The second Hadamard gate caused the zero part of the superposition to interfere constructively, while the one part of the superposition interfered destructively and disappeared. Let's explore further. We can change the phase using something called a phase gate. So now let's apply a Hadamard to create the superposition, apply a phase shift of pi radians, and then apply the second Hadamard. Now it seems like our quantum coin 
always comes out to be in the one state. The pi phase shift exchanged the parts of the superposition state that were in phase and out of phase with one another. So the final state is one instead of zero. This would be like flipping a coin and while it's midair, being able to somehow apply an operation that would guarantee that it always landed heads up or always heads down, depending on the operation. Impossible in the classical case, but not in the quantum case. What we've learned from these experiments is that this new capability of the quantum coin is due to its phase, a quality that a quantum superposition has, but a classical probability distribution doesn't. So the usual coin flip actually isn't that great of an analogy to a superposition, because it doesn't say anything about this phase. I think we can do better. I'm gonna do another experiment with our coin. I have the coin sitting on the table, heads up. To make it heads down, I can just flip it over. This is the computational equivalent of a not gate. Say we want to construct an operation that, if applied twice, would be equivalent to this not gate. We can call this operation a square root of not. So think about what we're physically doing when we apply the not gate. We're rotating it 180 degrees around, for example, the x-axis. So if we were to rotate the coin just 90 degrees around the x-axis, that would give us the square root of not. So we've applied our square root of naught, and the coin is just sitting on its edge. Now we can ask, is it heads up or heads down? Well, clearly it's neither, but we could add a step to the measurement process to force it to be heads up or heads down. Now the coin will fall to either heads up or heads down side with equal probability. Again, in principle, we could predict which way it'll fall, but in practice, this is difficult enough to predict to make it essentially random. If I want to measure whether it's heads left or right, I can squash it in that direction in a similar way. And it will again give us a 50-50 probability of left and right. But in this dimension, heads front or back, the head is already facing forward. So 100% of the time, we will measure it heads forward. So while the X and Z measurements yielded ran random results, the Y measurement will always yield the same result. If we think back to the quantum coin flip experiment from the previous section, this is reminiscent of how the quantum coin behaved. After applying the Hadamard, the qubit was measured to be either zero or one with 50-50 probability in the Z direction, but always the plus state and never the minus state along X. This suggests that perhaps a coin standing still on its edge is a better way to visualize a superposition state of a qubit than a coin wildly flipping through the air. Let's apply a square root of not gate on our quantum coin in Qiskit. We have this simple circuit. Then we'll use estimator to check the expectation value of the three observables, x, y, and z, which are kind of like collapsing our coin along each of the three dimensions like I just showed. So the expectation values are zero, minus one, and zero for x, y, and z respectively. This is the same result we got for the square root of not rotation applied to the classical coin. In fact, there's a precise analogy between the coin and the qubit state now. We can visualize the qubit state as a vector pointing in the direction of the heads on the coin, normal to the sur surface of the coin. So heads up, or the zero state on the quantum coin, is equivalent to a vector pointing straight up. Heads down, or one, is pointing straight down. And any equal superposition of zero and one points horizontally. The phase of the quantum state determines the exact horizontal direction it points. For example, whether it's pointing along the x-axis or along the y-axis or somewhere in between. This vector is known as the block vector and it fully and uniquely determines the quantum state of a single qubit. We can now reimagine every gate that we've seen in this video as a rotation or a series of rotations on the coin, or equivalently, on the block vector. The knot gate is a rotation of 180 degrees around the x-axis. When applied to our zero state, or heads up, it flips to the down state, or one. Square root of knot is just 90 degrees around that same x-axis. Starting from the heads up state, this rotates it to heads front. A phase gate is a rotation of phi around the z-axis. Since heads up is aligned with the z-axis, this doesn't do anything to the coin. 
The Hadamard gate is a bit trickier. We initially likened it to flipping a coin, making the coin spin uncontrollably in the air. But the Hadamard is actually a controlled deterministic rotation of the coin, like all the other gates. The Hadamard is performed by rotating 90 degrees around the y-axis, then 180 degrees around the x-axis. So applied to the head's up state, it ends up being head's right. So there's nothing random about a quantum superposition state or any of the standard operations that we perform on the qubit. Every operation is deterministic and reversible. The only time randomness comes into play is when we decide to measure the quantum state. Whether a quantum state is even in a superposition is really just in the eye of the beholder. As you've probably encountered, we're free to choose our coordinate system. X, Y, and Z can point along any three orthogonal directions. So, if we have a superposition of 0 and 1 in one coordinate system, we can define a new coordinate system, or a new so-called basis, in which the state is pointing purely in the plus Z direction, and therefore not in a superposition state. So when we say a qubit is in a superposition, we must also define our coordinate system, or basis. You may leave this module with the impression that we've just removed all of the mystery from quantum mechanics. After all, one of the supposedly weirdest aspects, the superposition state of a qubit, is really just as simple as a three-dimensional vector. But keep in mind that the coin is still only an analogy, and even the block vector is only a visualization tool to calculate the probabilities of the measurement outcomes. We can't say what a quantum state is really doing before it's measured, because checking that requires a measurement. We will discuss this conundrum of what is the true nature of a quantum state and how the quantum phenomenon of entanglement can help us elucidate this in another episode of Kiskit in the Classroom, all about Bell's inequality. In the meantime, though, if you want to play with quantum coins to learn for yourself about the superposition states of a qubit and how to control them, head over to the Quantum Coins module linked in the description. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.